Okay, if folks could take their seats, we're going to start in one minute. Okay, thanks everyone for being here. Good morning and welcome. I'd also like to welcome our online audience. I hope there's some folks out there. Thank you for joining us. And for those of you who have not met me, I am Maureen Adamson and I'm the president of Fleming College and I'm here uh, with my co-chair Jason Jackson uh, as part of our strategic planning uh, process and the first of uh, a speaker series. So before I start, I'd like to first respectfully acknowledge that we're holding this event on the traditional lands of Anishabi and Mississauga peoples. We offer our gratitude to our First Nations for their care of our earth and our relations. This is a really exciting day for us. I'm thrilled that uh, we have Ken Steele here as the first of our Thought Leader Speaker Series, and it's a key component to our overall strategic planning. My hope is that today, Ken will stir ideas, conversations, thinking about the future of Fleming and getting us all fired up. I urge all of you to provide your ideas and please attend one of the interactive sessions if, if you haven't already. We're trying to create as much access as possible. There's also uh, availability online to tell us what you think. We need to know what you're thinking. I don't think we could have found a better speaker to kick off our series. Ken Steele is one of Canada's leading experts in post-secondary education in Canada. More than 25,000 higher education professionals across Canada and the U.S. have come to rely on Ken Steele as a definitive source of breaking news, bright ideas, insight into student trends, technological innovation, strategic planning, branding, and recruitment. Ken has consulted with hundreds of colleges and universities helping them interpret market research, understand their competitive context, and develop distinctive institutional strategies and brand positions. Ken will be presenting to all of us this morning. And then after that, we'll be meeting with our senior management team and Ken, and including our union leaders, and then our strategic planning steering committee. One of the things that I've been emphasizing to you is that we need to look beyond our immediate surroundings. We need to look beyond our region, we need to look beyond Ontario, and we need to make sure that we are inspired with the ideas and what is happening in other jurisdictions. I'm sure that Ken will help us very much with that uh, venture today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ken Steele. <laughs> up a bit of future feeling for you this morning, so I defer to the exemplary Canadian uh, Back to the Future series to get us thinking about it. Um, as we look toward the horizon, we think about where higher education is going, uh, there is there's a great deal going on, and, and my main goal in the next 90 minutes or 85 minutes is going to be to try to just paint an overview that makes it a little coherent so we can talk about it in a single breath. Uh, because it can leave us breathless pretty easily. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with the uh, webcast I've been doing for the past five years, Ten with Ken is at tenwithken.com. And this slide deck will include some links to episodes that go into more depth on a lot of different topics. I'll make sure you can get access to the slide deck later with all the footnotes and links and so on from there. Uh, but Ten with Ken talks about everything from uh, marketing and innovations in programming, teaching and learning, some of the things we're going to touch on this morning. Uh, and you can subscribe on a dozen different platforms. Enough advertising. Okay, now about you. Uh, you were encouraged to bring a smart device with you this morning, a smartphone, a tablet, laptop if you really want to. 
anything that can get an internet signal would be great. Uh, what I want to try to do is engage you a bit in answering some questions. And for the folks watching online, uh, you can participate in this poll while we're live uh, as well. You just have to open a web browser and go to this URL, P-O-L-L-E-V, polev.com slash eduvate. So let me run through the common problems. Don't open a Google box or a Bing search engine or something like that. Make sure you're in a browser like Safari or Chrome. You're entering this in the actual URL field, not in a search box. So polyv.com slash eduvate. If it invites you to log in, you don't need to identify yourself. Uh, you can just skip that or, or let it randomly generate something. Uh, and there should be a question live already if you go to eduvate. Uh, if your autocorrect changes that to a C, which has been happen as well, you won't get the right poll question. If all you've got is a dumb phone, you can text your answers. Again, while we're live, you can text the phone number 37607. Uh, that is a phone number, strangely. Uh, 37607, start with the word eduvate with E, and then it'll engage you in the poll questions and you can sort of text your answers, although it's not nearly as elegant as using an interface. So, some of you have already found this. I see there's 37 responses so far. Uh, the first question is a warm-up question, just asking you about your own experience of science fiction and what you think the future looks like based on Hollywood perspectives. And I have a bit of a bias towards classics, I guess they'd be called now, like Back to the Future 2. President Biff really was modeled on what it would be like if Donald Trump became president. So it's really, it was a, 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 an immense gift of foresight they had when they created that film. The Matrix, Star Trek for the optimists, Robocop, Mad Max. Idiocracy is a really depressing movie. I don't really recommend it as entertainment, but it, it is uh, based on the fundamental premise that if you take Darwinian evolution and the smartest people defer having kids so long they don't have them and the stupid people are reproducing like wild, humanity is doomed. And so Idiocracy's got this sort of pessimistic perspective on the future. Logan's run, by comparison, was optimistic. We just kill everyone at age 30 uh, and so on down the list. So this is really just to make sure you're connecting to the right poll question. So again, you want to go to polyv.com slash eduvate with a V. Uh, and we're at 106 people responding so far. So we're doing pretty well, I think, for the room. If anyone's having trouble, maybe just confer with the person beside you who figured it out. Uh, but like I said, make sure you're in a browser and you go to polyv.com slash eduvate. Okay, looks like the winner so far is Back to the Future 2. This is... Uh, this is, well, what do they call this? This is, there's a bias name for this, Sherry, when the first, the first response to a question gets the most response. Anyway, we've got a front-loaded response curve here, but basically, some Star Trek optimists and back to the future pessimists, I guess. Okay. Uh, slightly more in-depth question now that I want to queue up, but I'd like you to take a couple of minutes talking with the person beside you and just discuss how you think higher ed's going to change over the coming decade. This isn't me cheating, my slides are already built, but how do you think it's gonna change before I prompt your thoughts? So I'm gonna give you three minutes just to talk to the person beside you and write some of your answers into that poll question as you go. So we'll have a collection of answers when we're done. Go.
tweeting while we go. I see. I'll certainly collect all of it. Get chew on it if we, uh, if we want. To. I think I'm gonna use. Okay, three minutes is not enough time to solve the future of higher education, but it gives you a chance to get a few things off your chest right away, and what we'll do is we'll collect answers, and uh, whoops, you can keep typing if you want to keep typing, but uh, we'll collect these answers and, and feed them into the final slide deck I share, so, so the data will all be there. Uh, those of you using single words, I wasn't sure I'd set the question up that way, so I failed to mention. We're trying to build a word cloud, but we can look at the answers individually. If you wrote full sentences, that's fine. Uh, in all of these word cloud questions, if you use the underscore character, your words will hold together. But you can see, obviously, uh, technology, learning, and online learning certainly were common comments. Students and skills came up a lot in your answers. Various forms of flexible delivery, uh, less something. Yeah, I, We'll, we'll look at them as individual responses rather than just a word cloud. But for purposes of this morning, this is a quick way to get a glimpse of what you're thinking about and what you're talking about, which is the goal. I'm going to propose that what we've got we, about higher ed changing after a thousand years of tradition, it, it's because pressures are encouraging change. There are forces for change in higher ed. I'm going to argue that there are about nine different kinds of force for change that affects colleges and universities around the world uh, based on watching uh, and both watching the changes and the trends and the bright ideas and the headlines for 25 years, but also talking with boards and leadership teams about where things are going, looking at academic plans, strategic plans, technology plans. There are these nine areas of influence that are encouraging change, and in response, I'm going to argue, there's about a dozen ways in which institutions are responding. And, and almost every response falls into these categories, so it's a way of organizing my goal with one slide to sort of sum up the 7,000 slides in my master deck. I only have 100 with me this morning, and I won't have time to use them all, I bet you. But basically, everything that institutions are doing falls in here somewhere, and the challenging part for you as you enter a strategic plan process is to decide what, what matters most to Fleming College, what, what we really excel at, where do we need to put our energies uh, out of all the possible responses. I'm going to start with uh, the most fun one, money. Uh, basically, politics, uh, funding, and demo demographics are, are certainly impactful forces for change. In Canada, generally, demographics is having a bit more pressure than anything, but funding is ultimately driving a lot of decision making. In response, institutions are collaborating with each other. They're collaborating with other organizations. They're seeking efficiencies and economies of scale in a lot of different ways, and I only have a couple of slides on this topic, so they will stand in for a lot of bigger ideas. In colleges in Ontario since 2000, we've been educating more and more students. That green line are the full-time equivalent students in Ontario's colleges, and we've been doing so with a little less per student every year since about 2007. Uh, the operating grants have been declined. So we're doing more with less. Many of you already feel that way anyway, but but that is an inevitability, and so efficiency is part of trying to teach more people with less resources to work from. The other thing that's been happening around the world is that uh, governments are getting increasingly political about how they fund higher ed. They are looking at various performance-driven formulas for funding institutions that are not simply how long have you been around, what did we give you last year. They are uh, not simply how many students are sitting in your classrooms and will pay you accordingly. They are driven by a whole slew of key performance indexes, and most states in the U.S. have moved towards this model of funding. Tennessee started it in the 1970s, uh, and now there are more than 70 different metrics that feed into the formula that determines what institutional funding looks like each year. They include 
how many students graduate, what kind of starting salaries do they get, what kind of research do you do, and so on. And the funding formula is a little different for each institution. Here in Ontario, uh, at least under the previous government, it was clear that the SMA's process was moving us toward a funding model that would be driven by KPIs like that as well. Uh, and they include notably some things like NESI scores, National Survey of Student Engagement, uh, high, high impact practices in teaching, so experiential learning opportunities, uh, opportunities to do uh, work integrated learning, retention rates, graduation rates, uh, access for indigenous students, francophone students, and so on, sometimes research indicators, and, and employment outcomes, and so on. So, more and more, we're in a world where these kinds of political influences are driven through funding to, to encourage institutions to innovate and to change and to emphasize different things, including uh, student learning outcomes and, and career successes, which most institutions have always tried to emphasize, but now the money is behind this as well. The other thing that's happening is as funding is tied to some of those outcomes and demographics are shifting, more and more we're seeing institutions looking at new markets and in particular international and online markets as a way to, um, to continue their, their economies of scale with, with fewer local students to work with. Uh, demographics in most countries around the world have been in decline since birth control became popular in the 60s. Uh, and StatsCan tells us that around the year 2030, the fertility rate will go into reverse here in Canada. We're going to shove babies back where they came from. And basically, immigration will be responsible for more and more especially of our younger cohorts, every year from now until 2050. Uh, so, so more and more immigration drives the youth cohort that is traditionally going to post-secondary. Uh, it's creating a phenomenon I've been calling peak campus for about a decade now in a lot of parts of the country. So in the north, in the Atlantic provinces, in the prairie provinces, there are a great many institutions that simply can't keep counting on growth through local domestic students. Uh, this, is, this is just a reality. And it means we've got more and more poaching activity. So institutions like University of Saskatchewan buying transit ads in Calgary, encouraging people to leave town and go to Saskatoon rather than Edmonton. Uh, we see that kind of poaching going on in Atlantic Canada when uh, St. Mary's University buys a billboard across the street from Cape Breton U that says, it's worth, a better education is worth the drive to Halifax, and so on. So a lot of uh, poaching activity, a lot of uh, extended recruitment activity. Here in Ontario, Study North is, a, is a, an association of six northern colleges that, with the help of the Northern Ontario Heritage Fund, spent $4 million to recruit students out of the GTA to come north. Uh, and because they recruited about 67 students for $4 million, it's something like $60,000 per student. That includes scholarships, flying their, their families up to visit campus, recruiters. It, it's an expensive proposition to recruit students, to pry students out of the GTA. Uh, and I was saying just a few minutes ago, you know, how do you do that? Fundamentally, it's not marketing, it's product. You need compelling programming that will draw students from the GTA or from Calgary or from Vancouver, where we've got the growing cohorts of new Canadians and, and international students. We also are seeing demographic shifts encouraging non-traditional markets for post-secondary, so more and more emphasis on indigenous students. Uh, dual credit programs targeting underserved groups, underrepresented groups in post-secondary. Lots and lots of different examples one could look at. Here, I think you've got, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, I'm sure, but Bishka, uh, which is a, which is a three-day orientation, a pre-orientation program, as I understand it, for indigenous students. Uh, likewise, we see more and more elaborate um, tra transition programming for indigenous students. Capilano University in BC, which was a college until a few years back, uh, has a, 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 an eight-month uh, pre-enrollment program, in effect, targeting indigenous students in which they can earn first-year credits, they become uh, acclimatized to the campus environment and to academic expectations. It's very much like 
to transition programs, many institutions are operating for international students. So uh, you take four or eight months of preparation, you earn a few credits, but you're becoming uh, ready to succeed in first year as well. Uh, and I actually did an episode just a couple of months back called 100 Ways to Indigenize, in which I tried to sum up uh, about 100 different ways that post-secondary institutions can better serve indigenous students, better reflect indigenous ways of knowing and indigenous populations, uh, and engage with indigenous communities. And, and there's certainly more than 100, but it's a starting point uh, based on some work done at the University of Regina. Okay. Also, we're seeing more and more students with disabilities arriving on our campus as we try to increase the participation of underrepresented groups. And those disabilities run the gamut, but, but 70 or 80% of the students at Ontario colleges who report disabilities have disabilities that are affecting their academic performance in the classroom. So, so universal design for learning is one of the more elegant ways in which institutions are attempting to serve students with special needs by providing options, a buffet of options in each course curriculum, rather than requiring them to request accommodations after the fact. So, so by giving them alternatives for uh, resources, alternatives for um, exercises, alternatives for examination and assessment, uh, students with special needs can find their way, and all students have more choices, which tends to lead to better learning outcomes and more motivated students when they have choices in how they get assessed. One slide is not enough to do justice to the idea, but I'm trying to cover the whole landscape this morning. We're also seeing more and more emphasis on non-traditional students who are not full-time direct from high school, and college, the college system in Ontario has always been much more balanced about this. Many institutions have 40 to 60% of their students who are not straight from high school. Uh, but, but across Canada, since 1977, more and more university and college students who are enrolled full time are actually working as well. Uh, and I've been calling these invisible part-time students because they appear to be full-time registered. They've got OSAP, they're here taking a full-time program, but they're also working 30 hours a week at paid employment or they have children and family responsibilities at home. These are not truly full-time students. We wonder why it's hard to engage them outside of class and it's because ultimately they are, they are squeezed outside of class as well. So, Part-time students are being catered to in a range of different ways. We've got early morning classes, MBAs before breakfast. We've got evening classes in Las Vegas. They run until 2 in the morning. Uh, and we've got weekend college at Fanshawe where they've compressed a full-time program into a single weekend a month. Uh, students can take most of their courses online, but they're on campus for a weekend a month. Uh, in order to uh, sort of have face-to-face -face contact hours with faculty and fellow students. It is not for everyone. It's certainly not for the traditional age student, uh, but weekend is, is another approach to this. Out in Alberta, I uh, did a couple of episodes talking with Lethbridge College President uh, Paula Burns about uh, some of their innovative approaches, and one of them that struck me is, is a modular approach to programming for an agricultural management, a risk management certificate program, in which you can take courses in any order, run a month at a time, and, and basically any month you can start the program taking whatever module you want in order to start. Uh, that kind of flexibility is something we're seeing more and more of, as well as the pathways through which that credit can be articulated into other programs at the college or even degree programs at the university. This extreme example of this kind of modularity comes from Arizona, where this largely online institution, Rio Salada Community College, allows students to start courses almost every Monday of the year. So students can enroll any week they want to start a program. Uh, that's a kind of flexibility that is out there for some students. It's not feasible for many people. I'm sure somewhere the registrar's office is starting to squirm. This would be a nightmare to implement in the system we've got, but it sort of shows you how flexible institutions can get if they're truly trying to cater to non-traditional students in a student-centered way. Uh, and it's not just programming, it's not just timetabling. If we're truly trying to cater to non-traditional students who are coming for night classes, it's not good that our student services offices close before they get to campus. 
So for example, an extreme example, in Florida, uh, FAU set up a drive through academic advising booth in their parking garage. You do this in Florida where it's a little warmer. <laughs> idea that, that these students coming to campus at night, commuter students, could stop in and get academic advising meant that hundreds of students got advice that had never gotten before. Uh, because it was available uh, only during the day when they were elsewhere. And likewise, we're seeing advising moving into the online space so students anywhere in the world, any time of day, can get virtual advising at Howard Community College, for example, using Skype and so on, an award-winning approach that they've taken to to advising. So more and more flexibility in terms of how we deliver support services, programming. Uh, but in extending markets, I mentioned international is, is the biggie for most institutions in Canada. That's because when you look at the next hundred years, uh, the youth population on the planet in North America is extremely flat here out to the year 2100. Uh, in, in fact, right now, Asia is the number one source of young people on the planet. Africa will become the number one source if you're doing really long-range planning around 2080. Uh, but, but there's no doubt that there are, there are young people on the planet who need education, who want education. They're just not living in this continent. So, so meeting the needs of international students is something Canadian institutions have been doing more and more of over the last couple of decades. And in the past few years, it's gotten really easy. Uh, for one thing, our biggest competitors, the U.S. and the U.K., have been shooting themselves in the foot. So between the Brexit vote and the election of Donald Trump, surveys have found 60% of international students are less interested in going to those countries to pursue an education. The number one beneficiary has been Canada that's seen a 30% boost in the people interested in coming here. Uh, in general, Canadian institutions across the country have seen double-digit enrollment increases of international students every year for years now. Uh, and some institutions are seeing triple digit growth in a single year, like Cape Breton University that doubled their international enrollment this year over last. But international enrollment is a very volatile uh, world. You're competing with thousands of institutions around the world. Currency fluctuations, visa processing times, so many things are out of our control. Uh, and all it takes is one minister to make one offhand comment about Saudi Arabia for us to suddenly lose a large pool of international students, or, or a significant pool of international students, uh, because their government pulls their funding or pulls their visas and so on. We're also, as I said, competing with thousands of institutions for international student enrollment. Uh, and over the next few years, a dozen countries have plans to enroll about four million more international students including Canada, but everyone is trying to grow their international enrollment, including some of our traditional source countries like China, uh, who are building hundreds of new institutions and attempting to, to increase their attractiveness to international students. This can take some interesting turns, uh, and I'm gonna share this example with you. This is an edited version of a video developed in Norway for BI Norwegian Business School. Uh, but this is a campaign they ran a few years back to recruit international students from around the world um, by, by overcoming some of their initial hesitancy about venturing into a new country where nobody knows them. Do you want to study abroad? We've decided to give one of you a flying start to your new life by pre-introducing you to everyone. Let's start with everyone at our campus. Our marketing class will create billboards highlighting your personal interests. Post them all around the neighborhood. We'll also include a short documentary about you on national television. Oh, you're good. A natural. All our students at BI will be introduced to a lot of important business people. But to speed things up for you, We'll throw in some ads in the most important business newspapers, focusing on your qualifications and skills. Now, this is pretty cool. At school parties, the students will practice the correct pronunciation of your name, which will unlock free refreshments. Check this out. Your name! <laughs> and of course, your name will be the brand. Are you single? We've already booked you a spread in a woman's magazine, or a men's, or both, if you want. This is Scandinavia. We don't judge. One more thing. 
If your privacy settings are liberal, then our distinguished professors and some 20,000 students will friend request you on Facebook and follow you on Instagram before your arrival. Let's show your name what I'm talking about. Welcome your name. See? Making friends already. See you your name. Tracked 3,000 applications from 200 countries, and and the winner of the contest was Emma Pinto from Mexico, who got the Emma brand rinks on campus. Uh, but but overcoming that anxiety is a big step. International students arriving in Canada, more than half of them report trouble making friends on campus, getting involved in campus activities. That academically they're doing fine, but socially there's a need for greater integration. And so institutions are finding more and more interesting ways to try to overcome that hurdle. Uh, there are platforms available to set up online chat relationships with ambassadors on campus to sort of ease the transition for international students. Uh, one of the most elaborate and graceful solutions I've seen is at Northern Arizona University where they have a, an engineering program in which students in their senior years go abroad to, to, to do a work study. They also bring in international students for the engineering program and they've got an entire residence devoted to blending the two. So they have four bedroom suites in this residence. Two students in each suite are going to be international students. Two will be domestic students. They're all taking the same subject. And they've selected them so that the ones that are coming in from abroad are from countries where the two domestic students are planning to go. So there's an interest in learning about each other's languages and countries and customs. Uh, and it creates kind of an automatic connection, which sounds like a great solution. It's just an elaborate one that requires a fair amount of scale to operate a residence on that basis. OK, so let me ask you a quick question and then a longer question. My quick question is, uh, how would you say the expectations of Fleming College students have been changing? And let's just try to build a quick word cloud here with some single word answers. So you don't have to talk to your neighbor so much. Just top of mind, a few words that describe the age in which you would say you've seen students change over your time teaching at Fleming or, or in higher education broadly. Uh, what are some of the expectations these students have? There we go. I my, turn my music way down. We need a little bit of that. Thank you. Otherwise, we start to get bored. We think, what happened? The room just goes dead silent. It's like we're in an exam hall and everyone's just nervously writing away. No, we need to that. So, lock in your answers. What are some ways in which student expectations are changing? typing if you want, but what seems to be largest in the associations you're making is the idea of technology, of instantaneous responses and service, support services, flexibility, mental health, access. There's a few negative terms in here like, like selfish and entitled, which, which are inevitable in every institution's cloud, so it's not just you. Uh, but I don't think we want to encourage that, that thought process either. There's certainly a growing expectation all of us have when dealing with any organization. Why do tax forms have to be so complicated? Why does application to post-secondary need to be so convoluted? Why do OSAP forms need to be so daunting? I, with, a grad, with, with two graduate degrees, I struggle to help my kids figure out OSAP application. Why is it so hard? Uh, the reality is that we're expecting more and more flexible service, instantaneous responses, online delivery uh, from everyone we deal with, from Amazon to our bank. Why not also our post-secondary institutions? Okay, so here's another quick question. How would you say digital connectivity has affected students? So if you were forced to choose one of these answers, would you say it's been a good thing that it's creating greater social connection globally and locally? Would you say 
It's creating more connections globally, but locally it's not. It's, it's almost isolating students locally. Are you a little more neutral? You'd say it has little impact. Are you saying, actually we're polarizing social groups online through echo chambers. So we're getting this polarization of uh, politics, of, of attitudes to the economy. Or are you, as it appears many of you are, the most extreme pessimistic end of things when it comes to digital connectivity? Is digital connectivity detaching students from society to become absorbed in social media? That's a very, I've not, I, I've only used this question a couple of times, but that's really uh, a strong response that you have. So, not too many social media mavens out there, although I know I got, I got a tweet on my watch while I was talking from, from your president's account that mentioned me. So I know there's some people here that are on social media, but we do have this lurking fear that we have, to, we have to manage it carefully. And I'm sure Maureen's got people for this, right? <laughs> but we have this lurking fear that we're being disconnected. And certainly when, I, when my kids and I are sitting at the table and we all have our phones out, we know we're doing something wrong, right? So, so social, social media and, and technology are creating this sense that we should be able to get instant answers to everything. But the digital generation is, is one of the compelling things that's shifting. And every year, the students arriving on our campus are more and more comfortable with digital technology. So I would say students are changing not just in terms of demographics, but also they are becoming more and more digital. They're more and more social learners who like to engage with their fellow students and tackle uh, problem-based learning. They're more and more anxious, we'll call it, that came out in your mental health references in the last word cloud, uh, and they're more and more careerist. And so those factors in, in evolving students are driving changes in student retention services, teaching and learning approaches, campus facilities, mental health interventions, all of these kinds of things. The reality is that when I was an undergrad, student services offices looked like this, and they were open from 10.30 until noon and from 2 till 3.30, and that was about it. Uh, we've moved from that world into a world of one-stop executive banking service for students uh, that basically 10 years ago now, the University of Calgary launched the first I had seen in the country, one-stop service center that brought together cross-trained uh, customer services people, student services people, who could deal with a student sitting down uh, in, a, in a very uh, relaxed environment. Uh, now this is pretty common everywhere. Uh, and we're seeing more and more delivery online services, giving students access, as Colleges Ontario does, to applications, to transcripts, to registrations uh, through a mobile app. Uh, and many young people will use their mobile phone as their primary point of contact with every website. They will write their essays on their mobile phone. They will read their textbooks on their mobile phone. So bearing on the mobility and the flexibility required, this is certainly a way in which we're delivering more and more services. Ontario colleges, librarians in the room, somebody is on shift right now on the Ask On service, uh, giving students reference text text answers, chat answers online, uh, not 24-7, but a lot of the day. Uh, and, and the most frustrating things for the librarians I've talked to about this is that they are typing their answers to a student who's sitting over there typing their question because they don't want to have to get up or they don't want to lose their spot or they're nervous about confronting you face to face with a question or maybe it's a language hurdle. So whether it's social or language or any number of other issues, uh, online is the way in which a lot of people prefer to get support. Some jurisdictions in the US and Canada have experimented with online tutoring supports um, run by the institution. So in Alberta for a few years, uh, the the eTutor Alberta program allowed students to get text-based or email-based responses from a tutor in their subject area, uh, feedback on a draft uh, report or an essay, uh, as well as uh, support and uh, answers to questions. Now, on the whole planet, there's probably no institution that has mobilized at scale student retention initiatives to the same degree as Georgia State University has. This is a place that has had double-digit increases in student retention and have done so through the investment of millions of dollars uh, in additional people, technology, 
uh, that has been paid for moreover uh, by, by returns on student tuition. So, so they have grown their enrollment, they've grown their retention, and that's paid for uh, a new level of student service. Tim Rennick, the VP of Enrollment at Georgia State, has done the circuit every, every week. It seems he's giving another talk. I put a couple of things out of a presentation he gave uh, to the New York Times Higher Ed Forum, uh, in which he describes what they did at Georgia State, because I think it's helpful to get a sense of what this can look like if you truly integrate an approach to move the needle on student success. Uh, these were our so-called success rates uh, a little over a decade ago. Overall, our graduation rates hovered around 30%, and we were a classic example of the achievement gaps. We asked a simple question. Are we the problem? Under the leadership of our president, Mark Becker, we became much more data-centered, and we began to unearth problems that we were creating that were causing the issues that our students were facing in, in large dropout rates. So we began to change ourselves. We set up a new uh, a smart texting system, a platform, where after the students are admitted, we ask all kinds of questions you would never ask on a college application. Are you working? Do you contribute to the finances of your family? Do you have a disability? What course in high school did you really hate? And we use that to begin during the summer to target specific messaging to students that's much more personalized than we were able to deliver in the past. And probably most impactfully, we started using a chatbot. For just the incoming freshman class alone, we had over 200,000 questions answered by the chatbot. Average response time was seven seconds. The trick to all of this is doing it at scale. And over the last 12 months at Georgia State, we've had 52,000 52,000 one-on-one interventions between our advisors and our students that were prompted by alerts coming out of this advising platform. We immediately saw a significant increase in our overall retention rates, and the biggest gains were by the students who struggled the most under the old system. We're up over 1,700 degrees, bachelor's degrees we're conferring a year over the last five years alone. That's a 30% increase and to be celebrated, but then look at this. Where are the gains coming from over the same five years? The gains are coming from all the students we were failing most under the old system. These are the students who have benefited from this kind of attention because these were the students who in the past had the most difficulty navigating the insane bureaucracy that we have created. We've more than doubled the graduation rate for our black and Latino students. We've tripled them, by the way, for our African American male students, and there's no achievement gap. Georgia State's a fascinating story, and I hope to do an episode on it one of these days, but I have not got it done yet. Uh, but, but they have the chat bot that gives six second responses to students on thousands of routine questions. And they build that chat bot based on discussions with staff and faculty about the most frequently asked questions and what the best answers would be to those questions. They have uh, pulled the last 20 years of data on student retention issues and identified 600 early warning signals that a student is not going to persist sometimes starting in the first week of classes, and that the, the computer system runs on 40,000 students every night. It looks for all 600 of those factors and tweaks those dozens of new student advisors the next morning. These are students who are showing one or more signs, and you need to reach out in the next 24 hours to, to offer support services to those students. So, so if you really want to do it, that's what it looks like. The trick is to figure out on our budgets with our strengths and resources, what is feasible for us to do in that direction to help support students. Technology is creating some of the mental health issues we're seeing, uh, social media in particular. It's interesting to see too that we're trying to use technology to solve it. So Drexel University is one of, one of several that offer an online mental health screening tool to their students and they even have kiosks on campus where students can fight, figure out if they might have a need for a referral to a mental health uh, expert on campus. And we're seeing more and more use of artificially intelligent uh, adaptive assistance for students, both in terms of student services and teaching assistant kinds of function. The, the latest and greatest example I've seen is in Australia at Deakin University, where they've created a tool called Genie on a platform you may have heard of called IBM Watson, a cognitive computing platform. Uh, Genie kind of reflects the cutting edge of AI applied to student supports. And here are some excerpts from a video in which they show it in action. It launched this year. 
Gini inverts the equation from supply to demand, meeting the students where they are in their own lives. So we've worked really hard to broach that gap between the human and, and the digital, so that every interaction with Genie feels as natural, as comfortable, as authentic as possible. So we've designed Genie to be useful, functional, efficient, effective, you know, all of those attributes that you would expect of an assistant. But our ambition is much greater than that. Our aim is for Genie to be capable of being a, a companion in, in digital form, a friend, if you like, that's always with you, always there for you. So Genie is for all of our students, and it's there to provide a supportive personal experience for their learning. But for Deakin, it's there so that we can provide it at a massive scale. Hey Ginny, can you pause the class for me? Do you need something, Olivia? Can you remind me to research two-factor theory in 15 minutes? Okay, Olivia, I'll remind you to research two-factor theory in 15 minutes. Did you know that two-factor theory is covered in a recommended reading from week two? Oh, okay. Can you edit my study material for tonight? Okay, I've added that too. Thanks. Playing the class. It learns more with the more people that are asking it questions, and it has machine learning in it, so it gets smarter and more accurate every day. Or a guide throughout their life at university, they're going to have to feel a sense of engagement with Jeannie and also a profound sense of trust, and they're very human emotions. Innovation is exciting, it's inspiring, it's what is driving us and is what keeps us focused on the future. What I love about what I do is that we can push all the boundaries. I suspect it will be a product very soon that other institutions can buy, uh, but it is narrow AI focused on students in a particular campus that can get smarter and smarter with repeated use. Uh, this past fall, the big fad seems to be uh, bringing Amazon's Alexa to campus, and institutions are putting thousands of uh, Amazon Echoes across campuses, mostly in the U.S. I don't know if I've heard of anyone in Canada doing this yet. Let me know if you have. Uh, St. Louis University, in particular, uh, moved the bar by putting Amazon Alexa bots in every residence room and every common area of every residence hall. So thousands of Alexas, and they produced an ad to, to just promote this great service to the students in which Big Sister is always listening. Alexa, ask Slew what's happening on campus tonight. Ask Slew who the Billikens are playing tonight. Ask Slew where the student center is. Alexa, call mom. Is Quizify even a real word? Ask Lou when the library opens. Play a guided meditation. What's the atomic weight of mercury? Ask Slu to call career services. Ask Slu how I changed my address. Alexa, ask Slu what time commencement starts today. The 2022 commencement ceremony starts at 9 a.m. Congratulations, Billiken. So whether it's chatbots driven by FAQ databases or it's interactive assistants that are voice activated in, in an increasingly real-time, natural-sounding language processing, uh, we're seeing more and more efforts to try to scale up what's humanly possible to support students instead of giving them things to read, giving them specific answers to specific questions when they need them. Survey census results came out in November from the Toronto District School Board and one of the questions they were asking students was about their, their, utiliza their screen time, their utilization of devices. They found, for example, that about 40% of high school students in Toronto are watching TVs or videos two hours or more a day. Uh, and that that is up significantly from the last survey, which was conducted back in 2011. Uh, that computer games, uh, two hours or more per day, about 30% of males in particular. Uh, social media, you've got about 40% of the females in high school who are using social media almost constantly. Uh, so, so we've got pretty intensely addicted to their screens, but these kids are 
uh, today. And what that means in part is our attention spans, because we're not al they're not alone in this. I mean, I'm addicted to my screens too. Every time I do the survey, it's like, how many hours a day do you spend in front of a screen? Well, how much am I asleep? Subtract that from 24. The rest of the time, there's a screen of some kind in front of me all the time, even if I'm running on a treadmill. Or, it, anyway, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter. I, uh, I think ADD is, is, is a very prevalent situation. It, it's a continuum, frankly. And some of us are diagnosed and some of us are not. Uh, but, but the folks at Columbia are alarmed at how short attention spans are getting in the, in the wake of technology like Vine, which was a six-second video loop platform. Uh, and this idea that our attention spans is down to about six, minute, six seconds seems about right. So here's, for example, what they think newscasts are going to look like. Welcome to the News at Six. Sweden invades Russia. Murder in Manhattan. Weather cold. In sports, win, 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 lose. And Grandma loves baking. Thanks for watching. Good night. And that would be way better than the half hour of crap we watch between commercials to try to understand what's happening in the news. Uh, online is not the best platform for everything or everyone. There are plenty of interesting initiatives to try to move massive open online courses out to students, MOOCs, to uh, allow students to complete their first year of, a, of an undergrad education purely online. Arizona State will allow students to complete an entire year through edX and then transfer that credit in at face value to their transcripts at Arizona State. Uh, but the reality is that, especially for high school direct students, traditional age students, who think they are digital natives and who think they can do everything online, learning online is much, much more challenging than a traditional face-to-face -face classroom. A survey of a million community college students in, the, in uh, California, looking at their performance data, found about a 14% penalty if those community college students took a course online instead of face-to-face. -face. And, sorry, there's a glitch in this software. Uh, not only 14% penalty, but a penalty is exacerbated for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. So if your household income's lower, if you're from an underrepresented group, the disadvantage is even greater for you studying online instead of face-to-face. Some students, graduate students, self-motivated students, uh, can succeed really well online, but it's not for everybody. On the other hand, a blended approach to delivery gives you about a third of a standard deviation more learning outcome for students when you look at a thousand different studies. So a meta-analysis conducted by the U.S. Department of Education concluded that, in fact, blended learning is better than strictly face-to-face -face learning or strictly online learning. That giving students a blend of technology in the classroom, a blend of online delivery with classroom time, was the best way to get students to learn. And uh, I think we're going to see more and more of this blended approach because it can save us physical space and some money, uh, but because it produces better learning outcomes. So we've all heard about flipped classrooms, about assigning some content for delivery online, and we're seeing more and more movement at colleges and universities towards this model. The other thing that's changing is not just how we treat class time, but what we're using as reference materials. Textbooks are getting more and more intelligent, and as McGraw-Hill's CEO said, you know, books are starting to read the students. It's not just the students reading the books. The books are quizzing them as they go. They are providing material in just the right order based on what that student has mastered. Uh, and platforms like Newton are being used to deliver foundational mathematics training at places like Arizona State. Um, I'm reluctant to, I, I don't think I'm gonna use, uh, I'll speak over it for a few seconds and then I'll move on, because I'm gonna run behind. But at the Arizona State, they're using Newton, which allows students to um, take a personalized adaptive approach to the course material. It moves them through content based on what they have mastered. So it skips over things they've mastered. It repeats things they're struggling with. It reports into the teacher how each student is progressing through the material and allows the teacher to structure groups in class based on student performance with the textbook. So these intelligent textbooks are becoming more and more driven by AI, more and more intelligent. And I did do an episode of a while back that needs to be updated on, on some of the trends in intelligent textbooks. We're also seeing a move towards open textbooks. Uh, here in Ontario, eCampus Ontario has committed 20 million uh, to developing electronic resources. 
BC was the first province in the country to jump on board the open educational resource bandwagon with textbooks. Kwantlen Polytechnic is currently the institution in the country the furthest along this curve. They have more than 70 courses that are taught entirely with free textbooks in first year. Uh, and these Z creds, or, or Z degrees, as the Americans will call them, uh, are credentials you can earn entirely without spending a dime on textbooks. So, so more and more movement towards peer-reviewed, online, open resources uh, in place of traditional textbooks. And resources are becoming more and more interactive in multimedia. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, one of my clients, ERA Institute, has a VR simulation they use to train radiology students. The virtual reality enables them to have an enjoyable experience and a very deep learning experience. It feels completely different to your normal everyday life. I could spend so much time in there. Well, because it's so much fun, you don't even realize that you're learning. I love it. I personally love it. I think it's a really great way to learn. Um, it tracks your learning throughout the program so you know exactly where you're up to. I can walk by the simulation room and they're using it at lunch times, they're using it after work. They couldn't do that before because the simulation gear we had uses live radiation so they had to be supervised. We can't expose patients just every day for no reason at all. Um, they actually need to be having an x-ray. You just need so many hours of practice to get anywhere so this definitely helps you a lot. Informed virtual reality or informed simulation is very, very powerful because by the time they get to the virtual reality module, they've already shown that they know the theory and now they're putting it into practice. You can't ever have too much experience taking x-rays. I think it's just a really um, great way to really boost up your confidence. So with the emphasis growing on experiential learning uh, and the fidelity of virtual reality simulations growing, we're seeing more and more examples of this. At MIT, Harvard, Waterloo, and others, they're using virtualized chemistry labs to teach students without using real wet labs. In the laboratory, students can perform experiments that are otherwise too expensive, time-consuming, or unsafe to perform in a school environment. It's great for prepping students before working in the lab, and it can also be used to demo more abstract concepts in theoretical classes. They can learn through trial and error and really comprehend concepts that would be impractical or even dangerous to teach in a traditional lab. So at the same time as there are many students for whom online learning isn't the best approach, the more experiential we can make the online learning, the more online students will have to access labs, to access workplace simulations, to access equipment that, at least in simulation, they wouldn't have access to otherwise. And technologies do keep getting better. I think we're just getting the glimpse of where this is going. The Google Glasses that everyone made fun of were, were early days Model T. Uh, there are already a couple of patents out there for uh, contact lenses that will display one pixel so far. Not enough to be very useful. But as we get more and more uh, unobtrusive augmented reality and virtual reality tech, we're going to see more and more uptake on this from consumers, from students, and ultimately in uh, academic settings. Okay, so if you were looking at this list of things I run through quickly, um, select all that you think have some potential here at Fleming College. What, what do you think might, uh, might change teaching here over the next decade or so? some things more popular than others. We'll find out that. It's hard to know when we're done because you could all select everything, so there could be a lot. I think we'll cap out at 700 responses or so, so we're at 470 so far. I treat these polls a little like microwave popcorn. As long as kernels are still popping, it's not burnt yet. But once the popping stops, you're about to burn your popcorn, so it's time to call it, right? Five, six, seven, seventy-one. I don't think we're going to see a lot of movement. You can keep answering. But, but it looks as though flexible delivery in terms of timetabling comes in at the top, experiential learning 
blended delivery, simulations, active learning on down, uh, flipped classroom, lecture capture, open textbooks, got a few fewer votes at least at this point. It's just an opinion, but it's the wisdom of crowds when we get a couple of hundred people's opinions at once. Okay, so the other thing that's clearly happening is the labor market's changing, industry is changing, and that's exerting pressure on higher education to respond. Colleges like Fleming have God program advisory committees in which industry brings their perspective, their needs to bear on curriculum and programming. But we're seeing more and more involvement of industry in higher ed at universities and colleges. And we're seeing more and more career students driving experiments with new kinds of credentials, with new kinds of partnerships with industry, with shifts in teaching and learning, and certainly shifts in program and delivery. This is for a number of reasons. I think first and foremost, there's a gap in perceptions in Canada. McKinsey did a survey a couple of years back in which 83% of education providers, like you, believe we're doing a good job preparing students. I think the question was, are Canada's youth adequately prepared for the workforce? 80% said, yes, we're doing an adequate job preparing them. But the students were only half that sure, about 44% said, Yes, we're being adequately prepared. And among employers, there was even less optimism. It was about 34%. So the students are actually a little more in touch with the employers, if that's to be believed. Uh, there's certainly doubts, and if nothing else, that tells us that more than half the students are unsure they're being adequately prepared. So institutions are capitalizing on that, and colleges have been, in many ways, riding a wave of interest as a result. Uh, in Toronto, you may have seen this spot for George Brown College, uh, emphasizing the fact that it's not all about technical skills when it comes to preparing you for the workforce. So I see you studied mechanical engineering. Yeah, quite a bit. Just how much experience would you say? Well, what's wrong with this thing? Well, I'd say based on the strength of its materials and the configuration of its legs, it just wasn't meant to support all that extra weight technical skills, and people skills. At George Brown College, we know what employers value most. So when do I start? You don't, son. You don't. So when do I start? Yeah, that should be an MBA student, not an engineer. But anyway, uh, yeah, so, so this idea that people skills are important, that interpersonal skills are important, soft skills are important, uh, is something that industry and employer lobbies have been arguing for some time. Uh, students graduating from colleges and universities across the country are quite conscious that the most powerful educational experiences they had were in fact internships, co-ops, and work experiences. They were the work integrated experiential components of their education. And that's why there's growing interest in co-op programming and growing efforts to extend co-op programming to online students. So Ripen is a platform some institutions are experimenting with to deliver an online co-op experience to an online student from an online employer. Expect to see more and more of that sort of thing. And we're seeing more and more interconnected offerings. So industry associations and major employers designing curriculum and credentials, uh, but also partnerships in delivery like Carleton University has with Shopify, the e-commerce company in Ottawa, where a select group of students are enrolled for four years. They are simultaneously employees at Shopify and students at Carleton. They're paid $40,000 a year, given free laptops and free tuition. They are taught by faculty at Carleton and by engineers at Shopify. Uh, and they have a work placement for four years that gets them on the career track for employment. So, so students who are worried about their employability will find anything that suggests an integration of work with learning powerful, but we're seeing more and more innovative approaches like this, and Shopify has just expanded this into the GTA with uh, York's Schulich School as well. Uh, I talked to Janice O'Farrell about that one in an interview I did uh, a couple of years ago now. In, in situations where employers are not at our doorstep, colleges also do things to create work experiences on campus for students. And Nobody in North America seems to do more of this than Niagara College. They have what they call learning enterprises that include a commercial 
Wow. Vineyard, winery, greenhouses, uh, a culinary center, uh, a restaurant, an aesthetic spa, and I forgot one. Uh, but but those, uh, those learning enterprises collectively are generating a million dollars of profit a year that flows into the college budget. The one I forgot was the teaching brewery. So between the teaching winery and the teaching brewery, a million dollars of profit. The other ones, I think, are losers. But, but those alcohol money definitely works. So, so learning enterprises are a win-win in the sense that it's, it's entrepreneurial and generating income, but also giving students work experience on campus in a whole range of different disciplines. The other thing that's happening, of course, to the labor market is that it's changing. We keep hearing the same statistics, 40, 50, 60 percent, depending on the study, of kids in elementary school today will be working in jobs that don't exist yet. We see think tanks around the world trying to come up with what those jobs are going to be, like augmented reality architects, nanomedics, quarantine enforcers, uh, vertical farmers, data hostage specialists, and the list goes on and on. And automation and artificial intelligence are doing some pretty dynamic things to the future of work, as you know. And again, studies are saying 40, 50, 60 percent of existing jobs are going to be automated out of existence by artificial intelligence by 20, 30, 40, 50. Uh, this is Oxford statistic. I trust them a little more than some of them. But, but basically, uh, AI is going to have a huge impact on the labor market. It's going to transform the nature of work, and it's already changing job descriptions in a lot of categories. UBC students created a uh, robotic janitor that can clean the floors at UBC and at Vancouver Airport right now. Uh, and we've seen a number of efforts at this to create automated devices. In the building trades, uh, there is a, uh, what's he called? semi-autonomous mason who lays bricks. Sam is his name. Uh, he lays bricks at three times the pace of a human bricklayer, 3,000 bricks a day. He needs a couple of people feeding his bin with, with uh, uh, notice I'm anthropomorphizing him here, him, Sam. Uh, he needs somebody feeding bricks into his bins, but he basically can lay bricks faster. He's using a, a computerized CAD file to determine the blueprint of the wall he's building. Uh, so within a very fine margin of error, he's doing a better job than a human could do by himself. So we're seeing automation affecting the construction trades. And just a couple of months ago in Japan, we saw this scary looking robot who now does drywalling. He's a little slower than human drywallers are, but if you've ever tried drywalling by yourself, this would be way better than doing it myself. Uh, and uh, the scary thing about this, I think, is that A, he's, he's in a dark color, kind of like a stormtrooper or some robot from Star Wars. But, but he's, it's the humanoid shape that's alarming about this guy. He's using human power tools. He can interact with human people on a construction site. That's eerie. And uh, it's still early days. where This is steam power. But, but, you know, that was as of October. In another year, he'll be drywalling faster than human drywallers do. So, so we know things are continuing to change. Even those of you in the culinary program need to be aware that technology is moving along. In Germany, Mobile Robotics has an automated kitchen that has been prototyped and demonstrated. I don't think it's for sale yet, although it was supposed to be. Uh, but this Mobile Robotic kitchen learns from master chefs by watching them through 3D cameras and then can replicate their cooking style using recipes you can download. Uh, so for those millennials who can't cook, there's now a solution uh, to have a robot kitchen do your cooking, and it even appears to do the cleaning up afterwards, which would be worth it all by itself. And those of us in creative fields, public speaking, news, broadcasting, also need to be aware that technology is catching up. Uh, just a couple of months ago, China's news agency unleashed a new AI anchor man. Hello, everyone. I'm an English artificial intelligence anchor. This is my very first day in Xinhua News Agency. My voice and appearance are modeled on Zhang Zhao, a real anchor with Xinhua. I will work tirelessly to keep you informed as texts will be typed into my system uninterrupted. If I were Zhang Zhao, I'd be a little worried about my job. I can be replaced with an AI that can work 24-7 in multi-languages, 
uh, and will say exactly what's typed into him, so there's no political uh, in influence from the speaker himself. So we're seeing more and more evidence of uh, AI sort of transforming fields that we take for granted. So where do you think we sit on this curve of optimist to pessimist? Again, we're going to take temperature of the room here. How pessimistic are we? Is AI all hype and it'll just never happen? Uh, is it like flying cars? They keep promising them, but I'm not going to live long enough to see. Will narrow AI continue to develop, but not real wide artificial intelligence? Will AI replace truck drivers, cab drivers, and real estate agents, but not my job? Will AI replace call center staff, stockbrokers, and maybe professors, but not my job? Okay, maybe AI will take my job too, but hopefully I'll be ready to retire. Or will you be welcoming our robot overlords within 20 years? Or are you sure they're going to exterminate us all? So how are we doing? Here we get 83 votes so far. There's a bit of a pessimistic slant to your outlook on AI. Uh, but there are, there's a third of you here. A third of you here that are going to stay positive that, uh, that the narrow AI will be support tools for the human beings. Uh, and I suppose 20% is also optimistic. You're, you're welcoming the robot overlords uh, when they get here. Okay. I saw an interesting presentation by Kai Fu Lee in Vancouver last fall uh, in which I think he's sort of painted a very realistic and reasonable picture of where AI is going. He argues that human jobs can be laid on a continuum from uh, more creative and strategic thinking required to less creative and strategic thinking required. Uh, repetitive tasks like dishwashing and customer support, routine tasks like security guards and truck drivers, optimizing tasks like research analysts and radiologists, complex tasks like economists or CEOs, and creative tasks like scientists and artists and columnists and so on. And his argument is basically, based on his extensive experience in artificial intelligence with some of the largest companies in the world, is that in five years, AI will replace these jobs in 10 these and in 15 those. And I think he's just being an optimist. I think somewhere between 20 and 30, somewhere between 20 and 40 years from now, those will also be functionally replaced or significantly augmented by AI. But he's the expert, so I'll defer to him. He also argues you can think of this on one other axis, not just how creative is the work, but how much EQ is required, how much human emotional connectivity, interpersonal skills are required. He calls it compassion. And he would argue that those, those jobs require creativity and compassion are the jobs that are safest from AI for the foreseeable future. He thinks AI will completely replace the compassionless automated tasks, which makes a lot of sense, that AI will work hand in hand with human beings on the more creative tasks that don't require a lot of interpersonal skills, that AI will do the grunt work like analyzing radiography scans of cancer, but human beings will wrap around that AI to deliver the bad news to the patient, to, to help them work through their feelings about it. And that human beings will still be largely the driving force using some AI tools in that last quadrant. And, and I think this is a useful way to sort of see where is things going. And it also underscores for us how do we prepare our students for the future then. That, that we want to make sure they are capable in interpersonal skills and that they are capable of creative and strategic thinking to be prepared. The World Economic Forum did a study of employment changes around the world since 1980 yeah, and found that the jobs that have been growing most are not those who require STEM skills. They are those that require social skills. The green dots on the top there are the growing uh, employment categories. The red dots on the bottoms are the shrinking employment categories over the last 30 years or so. So, so globally, you can see that playing out in the labor market. As Scott Hartley uh, says in a book subtitled Why the Liberal Arts Will Rule the Digital World, uh, he argues the solutions to become more human, not less, as we move forward. 
Now, it's 9.45, and I knew this was going to happen. I'm going to skim over a few things. We could talk about interdisciplinarity. We could talk about uh, collaborative university and college programming. We could even talk about um, the gig economy and incubators. But I'll leave the slides in the deck. You can take a look at the, the, the quick examples I was going to show you. I do want to share this one because it's hard to share in a slide deck. This is a way of visualizing the movement towards non-traditional credentials. The, the traditional approach has been to take a discipline of knowledge, divide it up into arbitrary semester-long courses, and to give students credit as they complete those segments uh, we call courses based on achieving at least half or 60% of the content. Uh, they can earn credits towards a diploma, a degree, a certificate uh, from there. Now, we're seeing more and more interest in shorter duration credentials, in nano degrees, in postgraduate certificates. And we're starting to see a movement towards recognizing students for what they do know instead of averaging out what they do and don't know, uh, in giving them badges for the skills and competencies they have mastered and allowing them to continue to work on the skills and competencies that they have not mastered. So badging is an elegant solution in that it recognizes thousands of particular skills and competencies individually, and employers can use algorithms to search for employees that have exactly the skills and competencies that their best employer, employees today have uh, as the technology advances. So, so the movement towards microcredit, towards badging, towards uh, non-traditional credentials is, is moving along, uh, and there are some collaborations like the uh, CBE network, the Competency-Based Education Network, that are trying to encourage in student loan policy and accreditation and employer recognition and so on for non-traditional approaches to grading. Uh, but I think the reality is that what we're talking about is things running in parallel to traditional transcripts for the foreseeable future. So, so in addition to our academic transcripts and our co-curricular transcripts, we're going to start seeing badging or skills and competency based uh, portfolios that, that move with a student along with those more traditional forms. I'm going to skip over that one because I want to make sure we have a little bit of time. One of the more radical thoughts too is to move away from uh, a one and done approach to higher ed that says you go to post-secondary for a year or two years or four years, get a credential, go into the workforce, you're educated to a, a more fluid, ongoing, lifelong learning approach uh, and that, uh, that in a way you can think of like the Netflix model of education. Uh, pay a monthly fee to, to keep access to courses, to libraries, to professors. Uh, Cornell's online MBA is an example of this where employers can pay as little as $40 a month for their employees to have access to the entire library of online courses in the MBA program. Uh, and, and it amounts to a sort of a subscription model for education. I think we may see a little more of that kind of approach too going forward. Okay, so I promised you one slide that tries to sum it all up. So this is my one slide again. The forces impinging on Fleming and other colleges and universities around the world are political, and, and I'm not predicting what the Doug Ford government's gonna do anytime soon. They are funding. There's certainly less and less money per student to work with every year. We've got to find more and more technological solutions, scaling solutions to cope with that, partnerships, non-traditional streams of revenue. Demographics, changes in the nature of Canadians and the planet's young people broadly. We've got these students becoming more digital, social, anxious, and career-focused. And we've got changes in the labor market, and that last little slice, science, is that yes, to some degree, changes in technology, advances in, in uh, behavioral science, in an understanding of cognitive neuroscience, they do to some small degree drive us to change what we do in higher ed, but I would argue it's a very, very slight force for change, unless it aligns with any of those other sectors. So if the government wants to do something and science will help them support it, science gets invoked. If students need something and science tells us how to do it, we'll invoke it. But it doesn't, I don't think technology forces us to change, but our students who are adopting the technology 
and expect a certain level of service from us are going to force us to change. Our faculty members who want to use the technologies, our industry that demands the technologies, uh, those are, that's what ultimately is the pressure for change. And in response to that, like I said, lots of examples we could talk about, about scale and efficiency, about collaborations between institutions, governments, non-government organizations, and others, as well as partnerships with industry and employers, alternative revenue streams that can help to support the agenda despite less and less money for students, uh, in new markets and international or online students, uh, retention initiatives, student support service innovations to try to help students conclude uh, successfully with us, campus facilities that support some of these changes to student services, to student needs, as well as to uh, teaching and learning approaches, mental health initiatives, teaching and learning changes, and the one thing, sorry, new credentials, one thing that responds to all of these forces for change is program innovation. And I, I started mentioning that early on. The one thing that needs to change constantly and the most and that responds to all of these pressures, I would argue, is, is changes in what programs we offer, how we offer them, the, the content of the curriculum, the nature of the experiential learning opportunities, and so on. I spend 30 minutes on this slide in two episodes on the forces for change and the innovation spectrum. So if you really want a refresher on that or to go into it in a little more depth, it's there. Uh, wanted to ask you one question to talk amongst yourselves about. So as you think about all of these forces for change and these innovative directions, the ways in which teaching and learning could change, support services could change, what do you think, based on your knowledge of Fleming College, the strategic planners need to bear in mind is going to be the most difficult thing for us to change? So let's take a couple of minutes talking with the person beside you. What do you think will be the toughest things to change? What are the immovable objects for change? And you only have three minutes to identify them, but times 100 people, 300 minutes of thought. Go.
Make sure that you get a few of your thoughts jotted into this question because we will be using it uh, this afternoon. I'm meeting with the leadership team and I, I'd like to go over it with them. Uh, and I think I said, well, I guess I told you single words, but okay, so single words, what are the toughest things? Uh, we'll, we'll go over this with the, with the leadership team and the strategic planning committee this afternoon, but um, certainly hundreds of years of experience in this room working at Fleming College and 300 minutes of thought went into this, so hopefully we gathered some nuggets of knowledge here about the difficult things to shift. Culture change is certainly the biggest uh, challenge in most human organizations. Uh, technology, attitudes, which are sort of related to culture too, uh, resources, and so on. I, I wanted to give you a couple of minutes, because I know there's a microphone set up back there on a, on a stand, and uh, we've also got a microphone here that can run to you to just take a couple of questions and answers. So think about a question. I have one last slide I wanted to show you, just a, a paraphrase of Darwin. It's not about being the strongest or the smartest or the fastest, it's about being adaptable when things change. And, and I think for higher ed institutions right now, adaptability, sensible risk taking, careful analysis of our environment uh, is the critical watchword for us going forward. We can be adaptable. So. Um, Thoughts or questions, comments, objections? We've got a couple of minutes and I'm happy to take a few from the floor or you can come up and approach me afterwards as many people would prefer to do. But if anyone would like to ask a question now. I see, I do see a hand back there. I got one. Do you have a question too? Um, thank you for presenting. I'm a student here at Fleming um, and I participate a lot around the school so this is very informative information going forward. My question is, with the changes that just fell down last week with the PC government and the OSAP and funding, where do you think that it's going to kind of hit in the next coming year with students coming in? Like what do students need to kind of be aware of to help the school um, to make sure that the students do choose to come to school even though funding may be limited right. for them? That's a tough question with no quick answer, but I mean, I, I think what we know about student financial aid is that in general, that the moves in, in a number of jurisdictions around the US and Canada towards sort of free tuition models didn't have such a huge impact on student uptake here in Canada because the, the tuition itself was not the main hurdle to begin with. Uh, but, but they did encourage participation by some uh, at-risk groups who overestimate the cost and underestimate the return. So I think, unfortunately, any move towards putting a sticker price on tuition again will mean that there are at-risk students who don't see the return on uh, an investment for a sticker price of, of, of tuition dollars. So it's, gonna, it's, it's probably not a socially progressive thing to do, but that's not a surprise to anybody. Um, I, I, I think, you know, for students, the important thing to bear in mind that the return on investment takes time. This is, this is a short investment for long-term return, and, and it's not going to change just because of changes to, to policy. It's just going to be a matter of finding that money somewhere else, and I'll be working with my own kids on that challenge uh, come next summer, I guess, any time now when we'll we're having that discussion. I don't, I don't think there's a quick answer to the question, though, of, of uh, students and financial aid. It's an important topic. There were a couple of other hands. I'm not sure who's got a mic. Yes. Um, my name is Javier Bravo. I, so, something that my mind went to was uh, we were well, we're talking about post-secondary education, but what about primary schools? What about secondary schools? What is the trend? And uh, because that's what we're getting. And so I don't know if you have some insights. Yeah, there's, there's a connection for sure, and my focus today was post-secondary. Ironically, tomorrow morning, I'm speaking in Toronto at the Digital Literacy Summit to 200 K to 12 teachers, and my focus is going to be on elementary and secondary. Uh, a lot of the same trends are percolating up. So the digital natives that we're going to see on campus in 20 years, 15 years, are already on campus for elementary school, right? Uh, the, the, the movements are, are felt first in the early grades and, and uh, the changing student expectations ripple up to us. 
There's certainly, when we talk about access to post-secondary for indigenous students, for lower income students, it's, it's particularly secondary school credit where they need to get their maths and sciences, they need to graduate in order to get to post-secondary, and that is, that is an interconnected challenge for access. Uh, and, and I think in general, the, the, the experts in teaching and learning at K-12 to have been pushing the envelope, and tech companies have been pushing the technologies to try to improve the ways in which foundational learning can happen. So the smart textbooks, the, the gamified simulations have been starting in elementary grades, uh, but they are percolating up as we go. So, so a lot of these things I'm pointing to at the post-secondary level are, are things that are more pronounced now at, in the K-12 to system than ever. Again, though, you've got even more influence of government funding on what the capacity is for schools. When I, when I go to private institutions, independent schools in Toronto, they have the resources to do amazing things with technology, have amazing class ratios, have a team of guidance counselors for a couple of hundred students that, that our public system doesn't have. So, so we, we know that it can be done, and it's being done in some places, um, but it's not evenly distributed like so much about the future. One more question before, uh, before I let you go. The room's gotten really warm. I, maybe it's just up here where the hot air's been coming from, but it's getting warm up here. I have uh, one question if no one else has it. So uh, as an institution, we look at cultural change, which came up on our, our reference piece there. We, we've been using this sort of ongoing piece of talking about what a student is and how important it is to support the student and how they embrace technology and as we change. So if the consumer is also our product in education, can you comment quickly on how you see the student being both our consumer and our product and how important that is in industry? Yeah, it's an interesting challenge. Education isn't really a product that we can sell to a consumer. It's, it's the result of a co-creation activity. The student has to do more than half of the work, right? Every faculty member will agree with me on that. Uh, the, the reality is the student is part of the team, part of the workforce that makes the product, which is a graduate, that, that employers then purchase in effect. So, so some colleges will say the employers are our consumer. The student is our product, and we're working at crafting them while they're here. But I think there's no question we also need to look at the student from a student-centric point of view. So just like, just like patients in hospitals, we're seeing more and more awareness that if we actually look at the experience of a student on our campus from their perspective, much of it's illogical, disjointed, frustrating, challenging, and unnecessarily so. And if we actually reorganize things to make it a smooth and seamless process for the student, more and more students will be more successful. They'll be able to focus their energies on things that matter instead of the things that are administrative. Uh, and, and so, you know, I don't want to discourage us from thinking of the student as someone that requires our service and around whom we should organize logic. But, but I do think it's, it's not, on a, not a bad idea to think about that student as, as co-contributing to the creation of a, of a graduate who's going to be a good citizen and a, and a future good employee, employee or entrepreneur, for that matter, out, out in the labor market. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time this morning. I know lecture is dead, and I did my best to liven it up a little bit. But uh, uh, for those of you joining me in workshops this afternoon, I look forward to a more interactive approach. Uh, and uh, like I said, I'll make sure the slides are available. And there are certainly episodes at 10withken.com where you can go into more depth on some of these topics. I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming. Thanks to the online folks. I think we have about 50. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, Ken, amazing. I feel fired up. I hope you feel fired up. We've got lots to think about and lots to do. We have a small gift that my co-chair would like to, to offer you. So okay, everybody. Thanks we need your brains working. So let's uh, get to as many of those sessions as you can and uh, start to build our strategic plan. Thanks again. Thank you.